And I appreciate the opportunity to be here and to talk. And um, certainly, if there are any questions, uh, feel free to ask them during the talk. Um, there's, there's no reason for us not to be flexible about that. Um, and so the topic is identifying Islamophobia in social media. And just, uh, uh, okay, so I'm at the last slide. There, we're gonna see the talk really quickly. Okay, now I'm at the first slide. Um, and so just a little bit about, um, very little actually, just in general, the areas in NLP that I've worked in have had to do with, meaning and semantics and um, trying to understand to some extent written text. Um, and most recently focusing on uh, both actually humor and hate speech and in particular Islamophobia. Now, what I would like to talk about today is just first a bit about Islamophobia in general and then more specifically in Minnesota, and then make some connections to uh, work in hate speech detection and what we're doing here, um, and then talk about some work we've been doing, uh, really collecting and annotating data from Twitter, which is the social media that we are uh, focusing on, um, and then some of the lessons learned and where we go from here. Um, so Islamophobia is a long and complicated issue uh, there are many connections to colonial histories and in from the western perspective the muslim world was often viewed as a rather exotic savage backward what have you kind of place and this was often referred to or this this view of the world was often referred to as orientalism and there's a very influential book by edward said of that name which really kind of lays the groundwork for what we now refer to as islamophobia the term islamophobia is maybe a more recent uh, way to describe some of these um, beliefs and it really gained uh, more widespread attention with the issuance of a report uh, in 1997 by the Runnymede Trust in the UK, which identified Islamophobia as a social problem in the UK and put forth some ideas on how to define it. And uh, the, the they had maybe three sort of fundamental ideas about what Islamophobia was. And these are listed here, a kind of unfounded hostility uh, towards Islam, uh, and then consequences of that hostility uh, in terms of discrimination, that, that this hostility would lead to discrimination against Muslim individuals and communities, and then a exclusion of, of Muslim people from uh, mainstream political and social affairs. And they were focusing on the UK, but this is in general, these are the kinds of issues that we are uh, thinking about when we think about Islamophobia. Now, in what we have been doing and in our conception of Islamophobia and others, this is not uniquely our idea, um, we are viewing Islamophobia as a kind of anti-Muslim racism. And this raises kind of immediate questions do we believe or does anyone believe that there is a race of Muslim people? And no, there is not. Uh, to be clear, uh, that is not the case at all. But what is clear though, is that race is often described as a social construction and marginalized groups in particular can experience a process known as racialization that views them as a sort of monolithic group, all who share certain inherent features, which usually are perceived as, or, you know, limitations there. Um, and so it's, it's a way of categorizing and to some extent continuing to subjugate a marginalized group in a kind of efficient um, way. Um, there's a very powerful de definition of racism that um, I, I recently heard uh, Ruha Benjamin uh, paraphrasing Ruth Wilson Gilmore described racism as the fatal coupling of power and difference that creates vulnerability to premature death. And I think that's a, a, a very 
important way to think about racism in general is that we're talking about both power and then difference or perceived difference that leads usually a marginalized group to be very vulnerable to the point of potentially experiencing premature death. Um, the interesting and complicated, there are many interesting and complicated issues with Islamophobia. Um, we are typically though dealing with people who have many intersections of religion, ethnicity, gender, immigration status, and all kinds of complicated factors um, coming together. And so it makes it a kind of rich and interesting um, domain in that way. So there is quite a lot of discussion about what exactly uh, constitutes Islamophobia or anti-Muslim biases. And there are various lists and descriptions, um, one of which I'm, I'm showing here. This is from the Bridge Institute at Georgetown University. And you see here various characteristics that are um, ascribed to uh, Muslim people and Islam. Um, and they may be familiar to you. These are things that we may have heard in our daily life of us, you know, violence and oppression of women and uh, intolerant of other religions, that it is not even a religion, it is a political ideology, um, that there is a you know, kind of mysterious plot to um, replace legal systems with Sharia law, that it's a, a foreign sort of primitive belief system, monolithic, um, that uh, all Muslims are either Arab or brown. All of these are very absolutely false, uh, to be clear. But these are some of the characteristics of Islamophobic um, actions and speech. Um, and so that's kind of what we're focusing on here. Um, as you know, if you follow current events at all, many of uh, the world's governments now have various concerns about either their internal Muslim population uh, or uh, um, uh, populations of refugees or immigrants that are causing concern. And we won't uh, go into the details of all of these, but certainly we see examples in the United States, France, China, India, other countries not pictured here. Um, what you may be less familiar with is perhaps the situation back here in Minnesota, um, which I'll talk just about a little bit here. And that certainly is a partial motivation for uh, focusing on this. Um, there was last year an article in the New York Times uh, with, a, with a very memorable quote and headline uh, that maybe sums things up, um, that these people aren't coming from Norway. Um, refugees in a Minnesota city face a backlash. Uh, Minnesota has experienced an influx of uh, refugees from Somalia uh, starting in the 1990s. And as a result of that, Minnesota and Minneapolis in particular have one of the largest populations of Somali people outside of Somalia. And um, typically uh, people from Somalia are uh, Muslims and uh, typically they are black. Um, and this stands in some contrast with uh, Minnesota's historical makeup of perhaps Native American and, and white people. Um, and so there have been many tensions over the years. Uh, in particular, this article is about a city called uh, St. Cloud. It's a smaller community um, in central Minnesota that has had particularly um, divisive issues over the last 20 years. And um, in the Twin Cities, uh, where there is a much larger Somali population, there is a, um, again, uh, quite a lot of tension in the community. Um, this is a, a story about um, tension and division surrounding a mosque in the Bloomington area, a south suburb of Minneapolis, uh, that has led to a, a bombing and various other kinds of um, harassing behavior from people who do not want uh, the mosque to be there and who I think do not want Muslim people to be in Minnesota, period. Um, of course, uh, you may uh, probably be aware that, uh, that President Trump uh, has taken particular issue with uh, 
Minnesota uh, member of Congress, uh, Representative Ilhan Omar, who is indeed a Somali refugee. She came to the United States uh, at about age 12 after spending four years in a Kenyan refugee camp. Uh, and she arrived in the United States not speaking English and has, um, you know, over the course of the last 25 years or so, um, worked herself up to be a, a a member of the US Congress um, and has been a particular target for President Trump here talking about an America hating anti Semite. Uh, this is a common issue in both hate speech and Islamophobia. You target a member of a group or a group as maybe being disloyal or not believing in the values of this country. Um, and uh, uh, that certainly has a powerful. Uh, influence. Um, he mentions in his tweet uh, AOC plus three, that is of course referring to the, the squad as, as they are known for uh, members of Congress who are, uh, are pictured here. Uh, two of them, Ilhan Omar and Rashida Tlaib are, are Muslim. Uh, and uh, so certainly that has, uh, that dynamic uh, has been present even in national um, media and controversy um, and uh, and certainly has had an in influence here locally. Um, recently, you probably have heard about the um, uh, unrest in Minneapolis this summer uh, and, and quite a lot of uh, discussion about defunding the Minneapolis police and so forth. Uh, in response to that, one member of the Minnesota uh, House of Representatives uh, alleged that there was a plan to put, you know, Minneapolis under basically Muslim rule or a kind of Sharia law. Um, and this was within the last couple of months. Um, so, so this is kind of an ongoing issue here. And I suspect most places, um, particularly if there is a, uh, a, a maybe newly arriving Muslim population or just a large Muslim population, there may be these kinds of issues. So, so there's a lot of um, local connections here. Um, so where does this take us? Um, our goal in general is to identify Islamophobia in written text. Um, and there are a few reasons for that. One is that it is relatively understudied in terms of hate speech and NLP. Um, it's also a very interesting problem because Muslim identity is very multifaceted and many of those identities are sometimes very marginalized and vulnerable like those associated with race and immigration status, uh, gender and so on, as, as is the case with Somali refugees. Um, it's also fair to say that Islamophobia and the different manifestations of it, uh, either in policy or in actions or in speech have a pretty significant influence on events in the world uh, and certainly this country and even the state of Minnesota. Um, and so how do we do that? Well, we're going to use some ideas from natural language processing um, and certainly draw upon hate speech detection as a source of inspiration and ideas. Um, and we are also going to need to create annotated corpora to uh, both understand the problem better and then to allow us to apply machine learning or deep learning to that data uh, once created. So, Let's talk a little bit here about hate speech. Um, and when, when we refer to hate speech, we can think of a kind of spectrum of language where on one end we have ordinary everyday speech. Um, and at the other end, perhaps we have something we might consider dangerous speech, which is hate speech that is so toxic and so targeted uh, that it could well lead to actual harm in the physical world. Um, there, hate speech can take many forms. Um, you know, a few of them listed here, insults, profanity, bullying, harassment, all of these kinds of things can constitute hate speech and it can be directed at many different kinds of targets. Um, there is not a single definition of hate speech, uh, like there isn't a single definition of Islamophobia, but an idea I have been thinking about and feel has some validity is if we think about hate speech as having a goal, what is the goal of hate speech? 
and I think to some extent the goal might be to deny a person or a group really a place in the future. Um, that that if, if the hate speech uh, issuer uh, got their wish, that's what would happen. Um, and so there's some serious consequences here to consider. Um, hate speech detection has been a, a, a real kind of growing area of, of work and interest. Um, and I think really in the last five years, it started to take off. And there are a number of workshops. Uh, there's a, a series of workshops, the Abusive Language Workshop, which is now the workshop on online abuse and harms, which will take place in a few weeks um, at EMNLP. Uh, there are a number of shared tasks. Um, Offensiveal seeks to identify offensive language. There was a Semival task last year on detecting hate speech. Um, there's a, a task coming up next year on profiling uh, people who spread hate speech on Twitter. And so there's just a whole lot happening. And so um, so that's that's very interesting. Um, Perhaps as a sign of some maturity in the field as well, there are a number of surveys available uh, that describe approaches to hate speech. And you can find collection, collections of resources um, like these from the Alan Turing Institute uh, or a website uh, written, uh, that, that uh, hate speech data that provides many different collections of hate speech data uh, for use by researchers. And so these are all really positive developments and these are signs of kind of a healthy ecosystem, but we do have to be a little cautious, I think. Um, and I think one of the things that can happen is if you have many, many shared tasks where data is being made available and people are engaged in a kind of competition to get good results, um, or if data sets are just made available for any purpose. Um, it is possible to work on a problem without really thinking about the problem. It just becomes data, you know, and you don't really think too hard about the problem or the people. And I think in the case of problems like Islamophobia and hate speech, that that's potentially a kind of dangerous um, practice, uh, that that can lead to some unexpected consequences, like we'll talk about here momentarily. Um, other issues with hate speech detection, um, often these methods are based on keyword uh, identification and lists of words that may suggest or say that something is hateful. And these are often very easy to game and trick and are often giving false negatives, false positives. There's a, a, a paper here, uh, uh, titled All You Need Is Love, which one of their findings was you could sprinkle the word love around hate speech and a detector wouldn't catch it, probably because it's maybe adding up the number of hateful terms and uh, non-hateful terms and deciding uh, if, if something is hate speech based on that. Um, it's also a challenging problem because there aren't any standard sets of classes in which we can categorize hate speech. There's a lot of variety um, and hate speech really varies depending on the target and the speaker and the local context. Um, hate speech directed at a um, Muslim person in the United States is probably quite different than hate speech directed at a Muslim person, person, let's say in India, not just in terms of language, but also in terms of content. Um, and so we have some challenges there. Um, one phenomena that's been observed is that hate speech detection, uh, the annotation efforts to create data, uh, annotated text annotated to indicate if something is an example of hate speech or not, it is hard to achieve high annotator agreement on that kind of data. And there've been a number of examples of this. Um, and that's certainly been our experience, which we'll talk about. Um, in addition, uh, more recently, there's been some findings that hate speech detection can actually carry with it some very significant racial biases. Um, and this has to do with the um, use of profanity or taboo words within kind of in-group communications. The specific example that comes up, I think, in both these paper uh, papers are communications between, uh, let's say, uh, two young Black men who use various forms of the N-word 
uh, to each other. Um, this is not necessarily hate speech. It is sometimes a, even a sign of friendship. Um, and annotators who are not really knowledgeable about that kind of communication often simply blank um, label it all as hate speech. And so you have hate speech detectors that end up uh, tagging relatively friendly communications communications between members of a marginalized group as hate speech. And so it actually kind of uh, creates a, a further uh, and, and equally serious kind of problem. So what do we do uh, going forward? What are, what are some of the things we learn from hate speech detection that we can use here? I think um, it's important not to see hate speech detection as just another classification task. Um, I think seeking out expertise from uh, people who know the domain, who live the domain, um, and to have relationships with those people is is quite important. And it's also important not just to reduce the problem to some kind of data set that you are working with. There's a very nice example of this. This is from uh, Desmond Patton's group at Columbia. Um, and they have used um, uh, young people who had some um, not necessarily gang members, but they were affiliated in some way or knew about uh, gang members and were used as experts for annotating Twitter data. Uh, and they found very significant differences between how um, these, these young people did this kind of annotation versus, let's say, the traditional sort of graduate student or academic. That seems like an important lesson. Um, it seems like we need to create annotated data uh, uh, to, to, to do a lot of different things with hate speech or Islamophobia. Uh, I think it's important to document carefully the decisions made along the way uh, to creating that data and, and to pay particular attention to the background of your annotators. Um, and this is something that is advocated for in an idea uh, known as data statements um, that um, Emily Bender and Bobby Friedman have been describing for a number of years for NLP. Um, so given all of that, what can we actually do? Um, well, first, I think um, carrying out a kind of qualitative analysis of your text uh, with the expertise of people who know the domain is very important. Um, and then you may be in a position to start collecting and annotating, uh, in our case, tweets. Um, and we should be seeking out diverse pools of annotators um, and have some kind of annotation scheme or code book that we can follow to hopefully increase the reliability and raise the level of annotator agreement. Um, and, and it's very important to be very iterative about this, do this at least a few times. Um, and then once we have done this, once we have uh, maybe some confidence in our annotated data, then it may be time to go ahead and carry out some kind of quantitative evaluations with machine learning or deep learning. Uh, but we don't wanna rush that necessarily is what I would say. Um, so, we have been uh, doing some data collection and following the idea that Islamophobia is, is, is highly varied and dependent on the tar target, the speaker, the local context. We uh, have been actually collecting tweets that are directed at or about Ilhan Omar, previously discussed. Um, and we do that first. Probably she's from Minnesota, so she has a local connection, but she is also um, representative of a particular um, kind of, of, of person. She is a Muslim, but she's also a black Somali woman who was an immigrant and refugee. And so she has with her many uh, intersectional identities uh, that make it quite interesting. Um, and that's why if, if you were collecting a more generic corpus of Islamophobia from, you know, from India, the UK, or different parts of the United States even, the range that you would probably be dealing with would be maybe a little overwhelming. 
So what we've been doing, um, we have been collecting tweets since April of 2019 and fairly simple, just using various forms of her name or ID uh, to grab tweets from. And we've done a couple of annotations, uh, a pilot annotation based on uh, the April 2019 to April 2020 uh, tweets and then what I call the 1020 annotation uh, based on tweets collected from November to October, November 2019 to October 2020. Uh, 20. Uh, the 1020 just refers to October 2020. Um, and so um, we are using the Twitter public API. And so it's important to say we're not getting all the tweets. There's a kind of down sampling there, but you can see even with that, there is a really large number of tweets that mention uh, her. and. Uh, uh, so there's plenty of data there for us. Um, our first annotation, this pilot annotation, um, I actually prepared a data statement about that earlier this um, year. That was as a part of an LREC workshop that Emily Bender and colleagues organized. And um, the uh, data statement is available. And it was actually kind of where I learned about data statements. And I realized it's a very valuable thing. Um, we collected 5 million tweets. Obviously, we can't annotate 5 million tweets. We can't look at 5 million tweets. And so we did a, a filtering of those that mentioned relatively neutral terms that would suggest tweets that were talking in some way about something related to Muslims or Islam. So Muslim, Islam, Quran, Quran. And then we just drew very small random subsets of these for pilot annotation. And there was somewhat low agreement on these, but to some extent that was expected or um, even planned for so that we could discuss and figure out what are the kinds of categories we really need. Um, you can see the four categories that we were looking at in um, one of these pilot annotations. And there's a, a variety of different factors here, but um, common themes, uh, include the idea that, that, that Muslims are not necessarily going to be loyal to the country in which they live, that they have some secret allegiance uh, to some global something, uh, or that they are highly sympathetic to terrorists, or in fact, terrorists themselves. Um, and then we were also curious to see if there would be much discussion of um, or arguing with Islam as a religion, for example, um, and then also looking at this issue of uh, Sharia law as being a potential um, takeover of Sharia law. Um, we have we found actually in the case of Ilhan Omar far more content relating to these questions of loyalty and terrorism than we did. Uh, either this idea of a false religion or, or Sharia law. Um, and some of that is due, uh, no doubt, to her very visible position and some of the statements made by President Trump and others that essentially question her loyalty and um, uh, allege, um, allege connections to terrorism and so forth. So that was kind of an interesting uh, result for us. Um, we went on to look at uh, a, 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 a different range of, of dates here and a, a little larger pool. And we selected some random samples of 384 tweets in, in this instance. And we had developed a more extensive set of labels to apply to those tweets. And we also began to look at the profile descriptions of the speakers or the, the tweeters, if you will, um, because we realized that that tells us something rather interesting sometimes about the people that are issuing the hate speech. So the labels that we ultimately came up with for this most recent effort, um, there's more of them, uh, which uh, is, is, is something we learned in that pilot annotation that we probably needed them. Instead of leaving tweets blank, uh, why go through that effort to analyze them and say they're not any of these categories? Let's maybe see if we can find a category for it. So you can see that some of them really have nothing to do with Islamophobia. They are just, there will be tweets to her or about her that are maybe not really about anything specific to her or not particularly political. They may be supportive. They may be expressing a legitimate difference of opinion, or there may be some kind of personal insult. Um, 
beyond that, the categories cross over into issues that are often associated with Islamophobia, but we can't necessarily assume that, that it is uh, an anti-Muslim bias at the root of that for some of these. Uh, because of her status as an immigrant and a refugee, um, there have been allegations that she's committed some kind of fraud to be in the United States or she shouldn't be here. Um, there are the uh, allegations of, of terrorist sympathizing and loyalty, which do seem often to be more related to her Muslim identity. Um, quite a lot of discussion about her um, potentially needing to be arrested or incarcerated for various crimes. Uh, and then as well, um, a kind of allegiance to Sharia law. Um, and then there's a particular story about her um, and her marital status, um, uh, allegations that she married her brother as a, an immigration fraud or was committing adultery with someone else and so forth. And so quite a lot of, of attacking there that is probably a combination of both her gender and uh, just that she's from a, a, a different country. With, uh, and and uh, uh, so, so, so these were things that we learned during that pilot annotation. So those are the labels we were working with. Um, just some examples so of, of what are we looking at here with these tweets. This is a tweet and I've, I've cut away the ID just to anonymize it a little bit. But here uh, we have a tweet that's addressing both, I think, these issues of loyalty and terrorism. Uh, Ilhan Omar say that I am white privilege, a woman who is not even from America who stands with terrorism. Uh, I think this is a free country with freedom of speech. I love the USA. I just hate people like Omar trying to destroy. So very clearly an allegation that uh, she is a, a terrorist supporter, uh, you know, questioning her loyalty, I would say. And this is fairly, uh, a fairly typical kind of tweet that is directed uh, at her or about her. Um, if you look at the profile of the person who posted this, you see a, a actually a somewhat typical profile for this kind of content. M much mention of family, pets, children, and patriotism. Um, and uh, again, um, maybe not what you would expect, but turns out to be relatively typical. Um, another example uh, is uh, uh, Ilhan, Minnesota, Ilhan Omar hates this country and wants to turn it into a Muslim country with Sharia law. She hates Christians and Jews. It's not the color of her skin. It is about her fraudulent dishonesty. So the, the tweeter is careful to point out that uh, he or she is not a racist, um, but um, they, they have other issues here, but certainly questioning her loyalty, alleging some uh, interest in promoting Sharia law, insulting in terms of fraudulent dishonesty and so forth. And so um, not unusual for there to be a combination of um, issues in these tweets. Um, and that makes the annotation all the more uh, challenging in terms of achieving agreement. Um, so the profile description of the person that posted that um, is a little uh, more distinct in a way in that it's a lot of professional credentials, obviously a military background, a, a you know, kind of almost a scientific uh, person in some ways. And yet this is a tweet that he or she composed. Now, one thing that, so, so we, in looking at this data, these, so these 9 million tweets that uh, we collected that mention or are directed at Ilhan Omar. One of the things that we wanted to look at was just basic kind of engram behavior in all of those tweets to see what kind of trends we would see. And so we wanted to look for, for example, um, one word sequences or one groom, one grams that included the string Muslim, Islam, and Quran. And just see, um, just see what kind of trends we get. Uh, these are, I would say, relatively neutral terms. Uh, uh, you know, that there's, there is no particular um, leaning here on these, uh, you know, a description of people, religion, uh, religious book. Um, and so you see counts here of, of words that come up, which don't necessarily show us too much in terms of hateful content, although Congress Muslim is a, is a curious term. Um, 
When you start to look at two grams though, you start to see a trend here where we start to see things like Muslim Brotherhood, which is sometimes alleged to be a terrorist group, Islamic terrorist, anti-Muslim, radical Muslim, radical Islam and so forth. And if we go to three grams that occur, you can again see radical Muslim, Muslim Brotherhood, Congress Muslim, Ilhan Omar. And, and so there's very little here that's positive um, as we go to four grams and then on to five grams, we see a, that, that there is not here a positive discussion, uh, it, it seems, of, of Islam or Muslims going on here. Um, if we look at the hashtags that occur in this in these tweets that include the strings Muslim and Islam, again, you see quite a lot that is, you know, leaning negative, stop Islam, Islamofascist, Islam is the problem, um, Islamic terrorist, you know, nothing like, you know, Muslim is, or Islam is the religion of peace or something, ban the Muslim brotherhood. Uh, again, you get a sense that there's a lot of negativity here. Um, we can do something similar if we look at terms that are typically associated with some of the content that indicates questions of loyalty, treason, tr traitor, hate, anti, um, as strings that occur in one grams, you, you see a few different um, uh, example, or not examples, you see the, the most frequent of those here. And as we stretch these out into two grams, we see terms like anti-American, anti-Semitic, anti-Semite, traitor, treason, she hates, hates America. These are all, remember, tweets that are about or directed at Ilhan Omar, or at least mention her. And so again, we're seeing a clear kind of trend. Is a traitor, she hates America, an anti-Semite, a traitor too, this anti-American. I mean, it's... Um, a pretty clear trend again, be tried for treason, um, anti, hanged for treason, all kinds of things here. Um, and so if we look at the profiles and if we just look at the most frequent bigrams, two word sequences of people who are tweeting at or about Ilhan Omar or retweeting, um, these are the most frequent biograms that we see. And we see, we see the most frequent one is, is people who do this, who tweet about her, at her, uh, for any reason, the, the, the most frequent biogram that occurs in their profiles is MAGA or CAG, I guess, make America great again, or keep America great. Trump supporter, Trump 2020. Um, and then in, mixed in with it, these terms of family, um, husband, father, um, mother, um, proud American, love God, Jesus Christ, Christian conservative, family country. And so you see a real kind of clear um, uh, political leaning here, if you're relatively conservative uh, in, in, in the United States uh, leaning uh, a set of beliefs. Um, and so we can see some interesting things there. Now, remember, these are the annotation labels that we were working with. And we did do annotation various times over the over th just 384 randomly selected tweets from this larger um, 9 million tweet collection. And I um, just wanted to show a little bit about what we saw there. And this is pretty typical. This is from one of these annotations, but the results were relatively consistent. And if we look at this, um, you can see that actually the most common kind of tweet was one that was relatively neutral, which you know we would expect. It maybe isn't particularly political, or is um, you know is maybe about somebody else. But there's no. You know, there's there's nothing much of concern there, um, and there are also, of course, supportive tweets. There, it's not that everyone tweeting out there is tweeting negative, and Islamophobic or racist things about Ilhan Omar. There are supportive tweets as well, and so if you look at the supportive and neutral tweets, that's about half of of 
in general when we take these samples and look at them. It's about half of them. Um, and then as you look at the other half, there is a certain number that, is, that just appear to be kind of legitimate political differences. Um, Ilhan Omar is a relatively progressive politician. And, um, and so people who are more conservative have differences of opinions and sometimes they are simply expressed as that. Um, and so that's more just reasonable political discourse and debate. The other um, you know, third of the pie are these more negative, often Islamophobic, um, sexist, racist kinds of content, including expressions that she should go to jail, often for treason, um, or that she is a traitor, she's not loyal. Uh, there's a story that she was a spy, a, an, an agent of Cutter, um, you know, and should go to jail for that, or isn't loyal for that, or just insulting content. Um, the content relating to her marital status and um, her immigration status as well. And actually a very small segment there for the Sharia law um, concerns. Um, that actually is not something that comes up as much with her as these other issues do. Um, and that may be because of her um, maybe unique role and, um, and story. Um, and, and so that's kind of its own interesting question. Um, so what do we learn from this? And this, we're kind of nearing the conclusion here. Um, first, I think it's very clear that the impact of the kind of lock her up and send her back rhetoric coming from uh, President Trump and other conservative figures directed at her and other members of the squad, uh, you know, Rashida Tlaib in particular, kind of send, send her back, lock her up kind of language certainly had an impact. We saw a lot of this lo questioning loyalty, uh, uh, send her to jail kind of content. Um, we also have learned, I think, that our annotation labels must be nuanced. It doesn't really make sense to simply just talk about text being Islamophobic or not, because there are levels here where it's uncertain and you kind of need to tease it out. It, are the questions of her loyalty, for example, Ilhan Omar's loyalty, are those based on her, her religion or her country of origin? It's, it's not perhaps totally clear. And so we need to have a bit of nuance in these labels. Um, certainly we've learned that a very visible politicized personality attracts a whole lot of repetitive viral content uh, that creates its own challenges as you're working through, through this data. Um, and then we've also um, be, become increasingly interested in these profile descriptions of the speakers uh, because we do feel like that does provide a, a reasonable indication of um, you know, some likelihood of this kind of content coming. Um, certainly this is um, network, uh, the, the social network, if you will, that someone has, their followers uh, and who they follow can also be an important clue. Um, questions that we're asking ourselves now that we're interested in are, for example, um, correlations between public events and hateful tweet activity. Of course there are, if something happens in the world, that involves a, a Muslim person or organization that can cause a flare up in this kind of content, uh, as can events like the election that's ongoing and um, uh, the Minneapolis um, unrest this summer. Um, we're also very curious about the in impact of location and uh, it's sometimes hard to tease that out of Twitter data, uh, but just for example, are people in Minnesota tweeting very differently than are people in other parts of the country or, or world? Um, also, I think we became aware that Ilhan Omar's almost celebrity status certainly makes her a kind of special case in some ways. And so um, I think we're interested in identifying less prominent public figures who are Muslim, who are you know known to be Muslim, visibly Muslim, who are targeted uh, or are they targeted in the same way or different ways? Um, and then the same for um, leaders and uh, public figures of other religions. Um, and then we're also kind of, you know, this annotation process is laborious and time consuming. Uh, we are, of course, aware of the potential for crowdsourcing uh, and having uh, sort of um, 
the work more distributed, but just is it possible to do that in a way that's reliable and um, meaningful? And that's uh, things we're wrestling with right now. Um, so going forward, I think kind of the big messages that um, we've learned along the way is that I, 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 I think problems like hate speech, Islamophobia, where you're dealing with something that is dangerous, uh, it is something that has a real impact on people. You you shouldn't reduce that to just data points, regardless of your background or anything. It, it, it's more than data. There are real people involved and affected. Um, and so don't treat this as just another classification task. Be cautious in your annotations. Um, learn the domain. Uh, meet with domain experts, train annotators, and to the extent you can build relationships. Um, one of the great frustrations, uh, you know, COVID has affected so many things and it certainly has affected, um, I was actually on my way to Minneapolis for a, a, a spend a, a week there working um, uh, with a, a couple of different groups in Minneapolis uh, who were interested in this project. Of, primarily people from Somalia. And that was when our, you know, first lockdown occurred and the trip was canceled and, and it's been very difficult to rekindle that as yet. And so um, uh, and it's been kind of a frustration. Um, but in any case, um, uh, I think the other thing is that when you're dealing with data on Twitter, it's often tempting just to look at that tweet, that text, that window of text and do something with that. And you can do a lot with that, but I think you do also have to think about the the speaker, you know, who is sending that, um, and then just the local context in which it all occurs. And so that's where I will wrap up here. I thank you for um, listening and and uh, and being here, and uh, certainly welcome any comments or ideas you have now or uh, going forward.